Okay. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. This is actually the first time I'm giving this presentation as a webinar. So you guys are our guinea pigs, and we're trying to see how this works with this many people listening in from all over the state. And actually, I saw some people are from out of state, so welcome. Um, so I'm excited tonight to talk about the third New York Breeding Bird Atlas. It's the project that's going on from 2020 till 2024. And I'm going to focus the talk around the joys of atlas laying. There we go. Um, so I'm going to ta start by talking about what is an atlas. So for those of you that aren't familiar with breeding bird atlases, uh, what we do is we try to monitor uh, all the birds that are breeding within a particular geographic area within a short period of time. It's usually a five years, five year time period. And we do that by breaking the state down into these really small squares, these grids that you'll see here uh, in this image. And, and then in each of those blocks, people go out and try to find as many birds that are breeding as possible, and they record all the different breeding behaviors that they see for each of those species. Um, so at the end of the project, you get a really nice detailed distribution map for all the species that breed in the state. And this is an example from the second breeding bird atlas, which happened in 2000, from 2000 to 2005. And this happens to be for osprey. And one of the things that you can notice for this species is that it's equally at home on Long Island, as well as in the mountain lakes in the Adirondacks. So at the end of the atlas, what we'll end up with is a map like this for all the different species in the state. And that leads me to my, one of the first joys of atlasing. And I think that that's something that everyone is always really curious about is where are the birds living in the state? You know, as are the birds that I see in my backyard, are they the same as someone else who's living in a different part of the state? And so by partic participating in the atlas and contributing to the data, you learn a lot about where birds live. Um, so you also, you also will learn a lot of information about the specific habitat requirements that they need for nesting in a particular area. So the second breeding bird atlas, um, as I said, took place from 2000 to 2005. And we recorded about, uh, sorry, we recorded 248 breeding species and three hybrids that were breeding in the state. And because that was our second atlas, we were able to compare the results between the first and the second atlas to see what types of changes had occurred during that time period. And so the first atlas was, took place from 1980 to 1985. And when we compared those two atlases, we could see that about a quarter of the species actually expanded their range, and about a quarter of them, uh, their range shrunk. And for the rest, they stayed about the same. And then in addition to that, we can also look at a species level and see that you know, two species that used to breed in the state were no longer found breeding in the state. Those are canvasback and loggerhead shrike. There's still a chance that we might find one of those species. Did everyone lose sound or? Okay, Adrian can hear. Okay. Um, all right. So, and then in, and then on the uh, flip side of that, we also gained. Um, some new species that moved into the state. Some of them, there's only a few occurrences, but other ones like black vulture and merlin, which I'll show you a little bit later on, um, really expanded their range into the state and have continued to do so. And that's something that we're, um, I'm anxious at least to see how those ranges have changed over time in the last 20 years. So before we get, uh, too far into this, I do want to say that this, the third breeding bird atlas started January 1st, officially, and a lot of people from all over have already started submitting a ton of data. 
Um, so over 600 people have submitted over 12,000 checklists, such as of um, earlier today, and 35 species have already been confirmed breeding. So I listed here as the most commonly encountered breeding species so far this year. You can see bald eagle is breeding all over the state. They started uh, on January 1st. We have the first record of a bald eagle sitting on a nest already. So um, they've been at it really early this year. And then a lot of these other species have just started in the last couple of weeks. And it's been really fun to check in every every week or so and see how many more records there are and how they're um, moving further north throughout the state. So why do we do an atlas? So there are a number of reasons why we do an atlas, um, and the, the data that are collected are incredibly useful for scientists, for land managers, um, for, for amateur bird watchers, for conservation planners, um, and just for interested members of the public. And the data that's collected are used to manage populations. So, for example, um, we have a good number of game birds in the state. Also to conduct scientific research. So after the um, second atlas was published, somebody used the data from the first two atlases and was able to track and see how much the ranges had shifted northward due to climate change just within New York State. And it's all, the data are also really um, heavily relied on by the state regulators in order to determine where energy development projects should be placed. It's also a really great way to promote nature appreciation and, and to engage the general public um, in science. And then it's also really useful to monitor changes. We can talk about that a little bit more. And so this is an example from that compared data from the first and the second atlas. And this example is for a red-headed woodpecker. And when you first look at this map, you see a lot of orange. And the orange indicates areas where the species has actually lost ground in the state. So it's no longer found in those areas. Um, and the Purple box are where it actually had newly occurred, was newly found in, in the second atlas. And then the green blocks are where it was found in both atlases. So based on this type of data, um, the New York Natural Heritage Program, which maintains a uh, conservation priority list, uh, very similar to the state threatened and endangered species list, um, they were able to look at this type of map and reassess the conservation status of red-headed woodpecker and say, you know what, this is no longer a um, reliable or viable population in the state, um, and now it's actually a very imperiled population in the state. And um, this is something that um, will probably be reflected in the upcoming changes to the threatened and endangered species list as well. So on the flip side of that, um, there are some species that, um, that actually gained ground. So uh, when the first atlas took place in the 1980s, there were no Merlin breeding in the state. And so some of you that might have gotten into birding a little bit later uh, might not realize that, that Merlins are a really new member to the avifauna in the state. So they didn't, were not recorded nesting in the state until 1992. So, sorry, my slides aren't advancing well. Not sure why, there we go. Um, so uh, with the second breeding bird atlas, when that was completed, this is the map of where Merlin was documented in the state. So you can see that Merlin is a species that is actually coming into the state from the north. 
then I was really curious, like, you know, I think of Merlin's as being pretty well distributed across the state. So I was like, well, what if I look at eBird data and for the summer months when Merlin are breeding, what type of distribution does that show? Just to get some sort of idea of what we might be able to document through the breeding bird atlas. So I did that and here's what I found. Um, so you can see that now, um, this is just data from the last couple of years, um, they're already breeding on Long Island and down into Pennsylvania. Um, so this is a species that we're going to see drastic changes uh, in their distribution in New York State with this atlas. I think black vulture will be very similar, only it's coming up from the south. So that leads me to the second joy of atlasing, um, and that is that the data are, that you contribute are extremely valuable for bird conservation and also for conserving the habitats that the birds rely on. So for this third atlas, uh, we do have all of the major conservation organizations in the state uh, involved in managing the project. So we have the New York Natural Heritage Program, which is actually where um, I'm employed. And then the New York State DEC. We also have the Cornell Lab eBird folks on board, uh, USGS Cooperative Research Station out of Cornell, the New York State Ornithological Association, SUNY EFF, and Audubon, New York. And I want to show you this map because I, I really want you to get a feel for how this is really a, a large community-wide project. So I uh, am the only paid person on the project, um, and I am based out of Albany. So I am the little orange bird there. Um, and then you can see all the purple and blue, blue dots are where um, the steering committee and the subcommittee members are distributed across the state. And then um, the little pinkish dots or red dots um, are where we have regional coordinators. Um, so the regional coordinators are really the people that are on the ground and interacting with the volunteers on a, on a much more daily basis. And they're really the ones that volunteers can go to and ask questions and make sure that they're, you know, doing things correctly. And then, of course, we're going to have atlasers um, participating from all corners of the state. And I know that we have some from New Jersey and Pennsylvania as well, and hopefully we'll get more from from other states too. Okay, so the the core part of atlasing um, is slightly different in my mind to birding. Um, bird watching, uh, most people tend to really focus on the number of species that they see. Um, and a lot of people try to find the, the more unusual or rare birds. With atlasing, what you're doing is you're shifting your focus to the individual birds and what the behaviors are. So it really forces you to slow down and really watch an individual bird for a period of time to really see what they're doing. And, and, um, and then once you observe a, a breeding behavior, you would enter that, you would record that in your data to the atlas. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of examples of the types of breeding behaviors that you would see. Um, so in the top left, we have a bobolink, and you can see that its bill is full of little grubs, and that is a clear sign that it's bringing food either to its young or to its mate that's sitting on the nest. Other species are really hard to detect. So this is a picture of Bicknell's thrush singing. Um, and obviously, this is a very cryptic species. You can only really hear them on the top of mountains at dawn. Um, 
and if you end up hearing one singing, then then you're really lucky. Um, and and other species like the mute swan um, are very easy to to observe um, during their nesting cycle. So you know ducks and geese and swans um, and loons and mergansers and some of the other birds. It's very easy to encounter them with their young fledglings. And then there's a lot of species, a lot of our songbirds that um, are a bit harder to, to find. Um, and, but when we do, um, we'll see them, you know, building their nest or carrying food. And if you're really lucky, you'll see one actually sitting on its nest like this yellow warbler here. So with all of these types of behaviors, what you would do is you would enter your data um, onto an eBird checklist and submit it into eBird. Before I really dive into eBird, I did want to say that so for me, um, one of the greatest joys of atlasing is that it really provides this great excuse to go out and to just watch birds and to be really familiar with what stage they're at in their breeding cycle, where are they nesting, um, what, how are they interacting with their neighbors. Uh, I can go back and I can check on them from week to week. And you just end up with this really intimate look into their lives. And they can, you know, be something that, uh, for me, is not, I wouldn't say like a pet, but in a way, kind of like a pet. It's like I'm going to go out and I'm going to check on my cardinal and see are they, you know, have they hatched their babies yet, and how are they growing, and oh, maybe the female's already off, you know, building her next nest um, and things like that. So, so, so for me, and, and hopefully for a lot of you, uh, atlasing can be a really great way to to really connect with nature. Okay, so, so I did mention that the data collection <coughs> for this third atlas is going to be uh, through eBird. So hang on, I'm just going through muting a couple people. Okay. Um, yeah, so for, for data entry, we will be using eBird. Um, eBird is um, an online database that um, probably the majority of you already use. And you can enter data either online through the website or you can use the mobile app. I'm stuck again. There we go. So one of the um, really exciting uh, reasons why we're using using eBird for data entry is that they've created these Atlas portals so that you can display all of the Atlas data in these really great ways so that we can track progress across the state. So this is a map from, that I took from earlier today, a screenshot from earlier today, showing the number of hours that people have spent already this year surveying atlas blocks across the state. Um, so the darker, bluer colors indicate that uh, more effort has gone into them. Um, you can see that Ithaca has a lot of hours, and I can tell you that a lot of the the eBird folks and Cornell Labs folks are super excited about the project, so um, that's just going to probably balloon from there. Um, and then another really cool thing that we can do with the data is we can zoom into um, different blocks and you can see summary information for that block really easily. You click on it and you can see how many hours somebody has spent there during the day or at night, how many checklists, how many species have already been confirmed. And then uh, if you want to, you can look at the actual block level data. 
And that's going to show you um, in great detail what has been observed and where it's been observed, when it was observed, what the different breeding uh, codes are that have been used for the different species. Um, so this is for the Oneonta Center East block, and you can see that American crow um, down there has already been confirmed breeding, carrying nesting material. And I think that um, Charlie Shine, you'll see that um, the list of observers on the right side, I think that Charlie is actually on the call with us. Um, so this is um, a block that he is out birding in quite frequently. Um, and you can see too, you know, you can see how Finch is has already been undergoing courtship. Uh, Carolina wrens are singing, uh, robins are already having territorial disputes and things like that. And then another way that we can look at the data is to look by species what's going on. So if you remember I said in the beginning, it's been really fun the last couple of months to watch the progress um, of, of certain species to see uh, where they are first documented breeding and then how fast it takes that for that to kind of spread across the state. So this is the map for bald eagle and remember there's been over 100 blocks where it's been confirmed in the state um, and that's the, the really dark purple squares that you see on the map and you can see that that has been just spreading up the Hudson Valley it's now up to Rochester and actually it just hit Watertown um, very recently. Um, so, so that's been really fun to watch and, you know, I think soon it's going to expand um, further up into the Lake Champlain Valley and St. Lawrence Valley. There we go. Um, so the other really cool thing is that even though we're, whoops, even though we are collecting data for the Breeding Bird Atlas, uh, all of the data that we submit goes into the eBird, um, into the eBird science. The, my animation is not working. I'm really sorry. Um, okay, I can explain to you <laughs> what, what this is showing, but this is an animation showing you um, the movement of American crestrel coming, you know, from the wintering grounds in um, down south and then expanding northward in the summer and then retreating again at the end of the year. And these types of science um, outputs um, are created by eBird, and I think they now have they have at least over 300 species where they've created animations like this, um, possibly more than that. Um, so all of the data that we're collecting for the Atlas is also going into this huge global database that is being used to drive conservation and science um, to help us understand birds globally. So that's kind of a cool thing, I think, um, but, you know, by participating and, and helping out to, 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 to report what you're seeing in your backyard is helping the Atlas and also this global database. So you can be part of something that's really big, a really big project. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about blocks and this is going to get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty details of how you actually go about atlasing in the field. So there are almost 6,000 blocks in the state and for each one it's, um, they're based on the USGS topo quad and then each topo quad is broken up into six equal blocks, equal area blocks and they're named um, based on their direction. So that's Northwest, Northeast, Center West, Center East, and et cetera. 
and the blocks are about three miles by three miles. Um, so roughly the same size as in previous atlases. Um, and so I will say that these maps, or sorry, these blocks are slightly different than they were in the previous atlases. Um, so in the past atlases, New York used a metric system for their blocks. And we were basically the only state in the country that were using that system. Everybody else was using this topo quad system. And we decided that we really uh, want to be able to, to look at the data region-wide. And so we want to be able to avoid having those um, gaps at the, the country, uh, sorry, the, the state borders. Um, so that's why we switched to, to this new topo quad system. And because they are different maps, you know, if you, if you were really involved in the previous atlases, we do have new maps available on the website for you to refer to, to get familiar with those boundaries. The other thing is that um, we are really interested in trying to spread our effort across the state. Um, so this is the map. So if you took all of those maps that I showed you before, like for the Osprey and the Red-Headed Woodpecker and the Merlin, um, and you laid them all on top of each other, this is the map that you would get. So it would show you how many species were recorded in each block. And so this gives us like this larger picture of biodiversity within the state. But behind that map, I mean, so let me point out here that, you know, there are certain areas of the state like around Long Island, like the western part of Long Island and, and the Adirondacks where there's a lot lower diversity than in like the more forested central part of the state. And then, and, and that seems to make sense. Um, that matches what we would predict. But then if you look a little bit further behind that map, you'll see um, that this is the number of hours that people reported observing um, in, in each of those blocks. This is how much time they spent in each of those blocks. And you'll see that like St. Lawrence County and Steuben County have a lot less effort put into them than some of the more populated areas. And so what we want to do is we want to um, make sure that we can spread that effort evenly across the state so that um, we can get really good regional, um, regional distribution maps. So what we did was we selected priority blocks. And so every Northwest and center east block, those green blocks you see here on the map, um, are the priority blocks. So within every topo quad, the northwest and center east are the ones that we are prioritizing. And what that means is that our goal is to make sure that we get some minimum amount of effort in all of those blocks. Um, and that's systematically sampled across the state so that we can really get a good handle of, you know, fill in all those gaps, even in areas that are less populated. So that's not to say that you can't go Alicing in the non-priority blocks. You definitely can, and I would encourage you to, if that's where your home is or your favorite birding location, you should definitely go birding in, in Alicing in those non-priority blocks as well. Um, but what we generally advise is that if you have a choice, if you have an option to go to a priority block or a non-priority block, we ask you to go to that priority block first. Okay, and then one of the things that I've found really interesting, so I've participated in the Breeding Bird Atlas in Vermont and in Connecticut, and something that really surprised me um, was that when you're atlasing and you're forced to, 
to find different habitats and, and, you know, look in all the different corners of a single block, it really, you really um, find and discover these new places that you didn't know how, how good they were for birding. Um, and, and they can become your new favorite birding location. So I do encourage you to, to keep an open mind too, if you're like, oh, that block has a lot of, uh, a lot of forest and I'm not sure um, that's going to be that exciting, you may actually find something really interesting there. Okay, so, and I, I do see your question, Adrian, and I will get to that shortly. Um, so, let me talk about how you're submitting data within a block. So within each block, we do want, you know, you to get a good representation of all the birds that are, are living and breeding in that block. And in order to do that, you have to survey the different types of habitats. So this is a block from the Hudson Valley, and you can see that there's quite a diversity of habitats. And as you go out birding in this block, you might go to the this patchy shrub forest boundary area up in the northwest part of the block for a couple of hours one morning. Um, and then maybe you still have a little bit of time before lunch and you decide to check out the wetlands and open water area. And then maybe on another day um, or a couple of days, you would visit the forest or the fields or the residential areas. Um, and over time, you would end up having visited all of these different places. And every time that you go birding and, and survey a different habitat, we ask that you submit a separate checklist in eBird for those areas. The one thing that you have to be careful of is to stay within a block. Um, and that is becoming much easier now. Um, so um, just last week, let me make sure I have my dates right. Yeah, so almost two weeks ago now, um, on the Android mobile app, they released the block boundaries are now in Android. Um, and then the block boundaries will be in the iOS app very soon in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's coming. The block boundaries are already on. Um, if you enter your data through the website, the block boundaries are already showing up there as well. Um, so there is that option. Um, and then uh, for other people, um, you may be more used to using Google Earth and those block boundaries are available in a format that you can download and, and put into Google Earth and, or into Gaia or Avenza or whatever mapping program that you use. And those will show you your, your actual location in real time. So you'll be able to see when you're in the field exactly where you are. Um, the other thing to be careful about is to make sure that you're not um, having, creating these really long tracks throughout the block. Um, one of the things that we really hope to do with the data this time, because we have data at a checklist level, um, we would like people to keep their checklist shorter so that we can actually associate the birds that you're birding to the habitats on the ground. Um, so if you're using the mobile app, for instance, the, the mobile app will automatically track where you go. Um, and then we can look and see, okay, you went through this forested area and you saw these birds. So we can really get at um, what habitats the, the different species are using. Okay, so with uh, all of that said about eBird, um, there is an important thing to note, and that is that we do have our own portal on eBird. And basically that just means that it's a separate um, interface 
that's designed just to show ATLAS data. And in order for your data to count for the ATLAS, the data has to be entered through this portal. So if you're someone who enters data on the web, then you would still go to ebird.org, but you would add at the end, you would add ATLAS NY to the end, as I've shown on the top. Um, and that just brings you to our website, and it'll look very similar to the normal eBird website, um, but you'll just go to that page first and then submit your checklist, and that will go straight into our portal. And then if you're using the mobile app, then um, what you'll have to do is change the settings for the app um, and set the portal to the New York Breeding Bird Atlas. So I am going to be putting together um, some uh, web tutorials that will show you how to do this. Um, that's something that I normally do in the training workshops, but um, they've all been canceled for obvious reasons. And so I'm going to use some of that freed up time to, to show you how uh, to put together these web tutorials to show you how to actually do those things. Uh, the only other difference that there is for, for the Atlas compared to a normal eBird checklist is that you would use the breeding codes. Um, and it's pretty easy. You know, you're just going to click on whatever species you observed, and it will show you the detailed page for that species. And there's a little section that says breeding code. And the whole list, you know, your whole list of options that I have here on the right will show up. And you just select the, the breeding behavior that you saw. Um, and then currently you can only enter one breeding code per species. Um, so what we do is ask you to enter the highest or the strongest code that you observe on that, um, on that particular outing. So, you know, I have the example here of a gray capper. And when you, you know, first get out of your car, you're going to hear one singing. And then maybe you walk a little further and you'll actually see one um, carrying food. And so carrying food is a stronger code than a singing bird. So you would enter the carrying food is what you would do. And somebody just asked if you submit your observations outside the portal, will it count for the atlas? And the answer is no. Um, we ask that you use the Atlas portal, um, which kind of serves as two purposes. One, um, that tells us that you know about the Atlas, that the Atlas is going on, and that you're familiar with the block boundaries and also the, the breeding codes. Um, so we don't want just anybody to be using the portal. We want to make sure that people are aware of um, the project and, and the, the methodology that we're using. Um, so you don't need to re-enter your observations but, uh, per se, but you can, you can change the portal after the fact. And I do have, um, I do walk you through how to do that on the website. There is a page that shows you how to do that. It's really easy. Um, right, so and then Richard just asked, what if you see more than one um, individual of a species and they're, and they're doing different behaviors? Again, you would just enter the highest code, so the strongest evidence. So you might, you know, with a catbird, you might see, you know, one, one family is still building their nest and then you go to another side of, you know, part of the trail. And you'll see another family that's actually already got young and they're carrying food and feeding their young. Um, so you would use that the highest code, the strongest code, um, which on this screen here is the lowest, is you know, further down on this list. So the strongest, the highest code you could have is nest with young, and the weakest would be in the appropriate habitat. So at some point, the amount of effort that you're spending in a block 
will kind of drop off and, and you're not going to find more species, you're not going to find um, more evidence of breeding. And at that point, we would want you to stop visiting that block and try to go to another block um, where we could, you know, spread out that effort a little bit better. Um, so in order to facilitate that, we, we do have block completion guidelines. And that's a whole suite of things that all of these different guidelines have to be met in order for that block to be considered complete. And the goal of the Atlas is to have all of the priority blocks completed over five years. Um, so those, these guidelines include visiting all the different habitats that are accessible. Um, we do realize that, you know, there are some areas where you just can't access um, a lot of the land. Um, and then that you would visit throughout the breeding season. You know, there's some species that are, that are breeding as early as January, and some of them are going, you know, they're not even going to start until July or August. Um, so we do want you to go at different times of the year so that you're getting a good representation of all the birds. Um, and it's the same thing um, with, you know, diurnal and and crepuscular and nocturnal birds, we do want you to, to go, you know, most of your time should probably be spent during the day, but hopefully a couple hours at night and, and at dusk as well. And then we don't have one specific target for the entire state of how many species you should be finding in a block. Um, that can vary quite a bit just depending on habitat diversity and the level of development and just the climate and where you are in the state, the elevation, all types of factors. And so uh, we have this range. So wherever you are in the state, you should have at least 55 species. Um, if you're on Long Island, that might be as much as you're going to get. Um, but if you're in the central part of the state, um, you're probably going to get 90 or 100 species in the block. And so that's um, you know, going to be somewhat dependent on the actual conditions within the block. And then however many species there are recorded in the block, half of those should be confirmed. And so that's the, the highest level of codes that we have. So those are, um, a, there's a number of codes, I think about a dozen codes where you know, things like carrying food or feeding young or recently fledged young or a nest with eggs, things like that, that these types of behaviors that are really strong evidence that they're, that they're breeding in that area. And then all of these guidelines, um, they don't need to be met every single year. That's a total over the five-year project. Um, so, so we think that that's pretty doable. And Colleen is asking if um, there are landowner letters. Uh, yes, I do have landowner letters on the website. Um, I have a letter that explains, introduces the project, and, um, and then I also have a letter, like a thank you letter, so if you do get permission from someone, um, you can, you know, give them a report of what you actually did find on their land. So those are available on the website. So all of that together, um, basically what that comes down to is that there's no more summer doldrums. Uh, a lot of people kind of slow down their birding a bit in the summer. They're like, you know, things are pretty quiet and, you know, birds aren't moving around so much. And, and so a lot of people will, will pick up other hobbies. Um, but with the Atlas, hopefully you'll find a lot more excuses to go out uh, birding in the summer months. So one of the concerns that a lot of people have with using eBird is that your data becomes public. And that's true. Um, but one of the things that we did was we met with people from DC, um, the New York Natural Heritage, and also the eBird team. And we tried to uh, develop a, a short list of species for which we didn't want their location to be uh, publicly available um, because we thought that they would be subject to 
disturbance, which would cause them to abandon or, or abandon their nest or they would fail. Um, so those species will be hidden. Uh, some of them are, their location will be hidden year round and, and some um, will be hidden just for the, the breeding season. So the species that we have here um, from the top left are short-eared owl, spruce grouse, golden eagle, and then the middle column is black rail, northern goshawk, king rail, and then on the right we have the barn owl, loggerhead shrike, and long-eared owl. Okay, so there's a lot of questions about landowner, and I think I'll answer those at the end, just so I can finish um, this part of the presentation. And then what Tom is asking, I can see a sensitive species report. Are you saying that no one else can see that on the Atlas portal? So I should back up and say that for these species, um, it's still in the database. It's, their, their location is not visible beyond a 20 square kilometer grid. So you'll get, um, you'll, you'll see like a big block, but if you zoom in and try to see the point location for that observation, you're not going to see it. So you can see your, your own observations. Other members of the, the eBird community will not see those observations. Um, I do see those observations, like for the Alice purposes, I do see those. Um, I will have access to those data and, and the other members of the, the Alice team. Okay, so for those of you that um, might be new to eBERT, um, there are a couple of ways to, to get started, and I do recommend that you would um, get started as soon as possible because the birds are already on their way back. Um, so there's a, a free online course that the eBird team put together um, and that's available through the Cornell Labs Bird Academy. It's called eBird Essentials and that's just a web tutorial that will walk you through the basics of eBird. Um, as you have been doing workshops around the state, um, Unfortunately, a lot of those are, are canceled for the foreseeable future. So again, I'm going to try to be um, putting those together as uh, web tutorials. So I'll be doing, um, I'll just pre-record some videos and I'll put those up online for everyone um, so that they're just permanently available. Um, and then on top of that, there, this is also a bit on hold right now. Um, but we have been collecting the names of people that are interested in being mentored um, that, you know, might be willing to help someone get started with eBird, sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and, and show you how to do it. Of course, that will have to wait until after the coronavirus um, concerns are put aside, um, but uh, that is an option eventually as well. Um, I'm also looking at doing some more uh, webinars and maybe Facebook Live events and things like that. Um, and somebody's asking how you would sign up for that. And um, those types of events I will put out through our Atlas newsletter. So, uh, and also on our website and also on our Facebook page. So all of that um, information I will show you at the end of the presentation. I have a slide that shows you all of our social media contacts. Okay, so uh, I do feel like, you know, we've, we've really tried to make this project be open to as many members of the public as possible. Um, whether you're a young birder, an older birder, um, you can, um, only do what's, you know, easily available in your backyard or some car birding, or here's somebody who's going to be like hiking the mountains in the Adirondacks. Um, there's really a place for everybody. Um, the, the really, the key parts of the Atlas are to visit a block, observe the behaviors, and enter an eBird. 
And there is no uh, set amount of commitment that you need to um, sign up for. You can do as little or as much as you want. And um, okay, so I see if you see a male female pair and you see them hanging out together, do you report them as a pair? Um, and that's getting a little bit more detailed, but, but yeah, if you see right now, um, there's a lot of waterfowl that are courting, um, some of the um, you know, red-bellied woodpeckers are courting, um, and some of the morning doves are starting to pair off as well. And if you start to see those pairs hanging out, then, and, and you suspect that they're yeah, a mated pair, then, then yes, definitely enter that into the atlas. Um, and, and really, you know, I, I, I do feel like, you know, even if you live in the city, you know, and you're only seeing house sparrows and starlings and rock pigeons, um, that's also really valuable information. Um, we want to know where those invasives are because they are, um, you know, going to impact where the native species are. So, so really, every sighting counts. And, and, you know, as little or as much as you can contribute um, is, is really appreciated. So um, I do feel like atlasing in the long run um, is a really great way to, to find new friends. Uh, we will be hosting, you know, parties and volunteer appreciation events and uh, block busting events and, you know, doing walks and things like that. Um, and, and we are developing quite a, quite a good community um, online on Facebook as well. So, so there is really a great potential to, to make new friends as well. Okay, so I do want to point people to the Atlas website. And, and you'll see that um, the Atlas website that I have up here, uber.org slash atlasny. It's, that is the portal, that's our website, that's our blog, that's everything is right there in that one place. So as long as you have that URL bookmarked, you're set for the Atlas. Um, and on the website, I do have all kinds of information up there um, about how to get started, more information about how to enter data, how to use eBird, um, how to contact the regional coordinator, and all the events that were going on, um, uh, as well as uh, links to uh, other web tutorials that are up as well from other uh, states and countries um, and, and all sorts of other information. So I do encourage you to check that out. Uh, one of the things that I have up there, I have a whole page with all kinds of different uh, reference materials that are really good to, to take a look at and just remember that they're available. And so I have, you know, things like the handbook, I have a breeding date charts, I have acceptable codes, uh, you know, tips and tricks, field data sheets, the landowner letters and things like that. Now this is an example of one of the charts we have available. This is the breeding timeline chart. And this shows you for all of the species that are breeding in the state um, by month and by the week within the month, whether or not that, in, that bird um, is wintering or migrating or transitioning into breeding. Um, and so this is a really good tool to, to help you um, just see what you might be looking out for this time of year. Okay, and then I will also put a plug in for there's a ton of other really great apps and websites out there. Um, hang on, somebody. Um, a couple people just joined in. Um, Okay, so there's some, some really great apps out there, um, and a lot of them are free. 
Um, so Merlin is fully integrated with the eBird app. So if you already have eBird, I recommend you get Merlin. Um, and then if you ever have a question on your sighting, you can, you can click on the, the Merlin link and it will take you to the page for Merlin um, for that species. And it will show you um, the distribution. It will tell you how to identify it. It will have sounds and all that kind of stuff. Um, Audubon does, has a free app that's also really great. Um, I also use that one quite a lot, um, particularly for the sounds. Um, there's also Song Sleuth, which will identify songs for you. There's an All About Birds website, which probably all of you are familiar with already. There's a LarkWire is a great app if you're trying to learn songs. It has like a game, uh, a built-in game to help you learn learn the songs. And then all of the field guides are available as apps as well. Um, and then actually I need to update my slide. Birds of North America is a great resource. It has now been rolled into Birds of the World. Um, and if you are an eBird uh, participant, then you get a discount on the subscription for that. So I think it's like 36 or $37 for the year. And that is really like the definitive source for everything that's known for, for all the natural history for, for every species that breeds in North America. Um, so I do recommend that. Uh, a lot of libraries actually have access to that as well. So you may be able to find access to it for free. So how can you get involved? And um, after listening to this talk, I'd say the next steps would be um, to, to visit the website. Um, you'll see on there, there's a link to sign up for our e-newsletter. Um, definitely do that. That's where you'll get notifications um, about events and also tips and tricks and um, some of the other fun stuff on there. Um, there is a handbook which has basically everything on the website in one place. You can also follow us on social media. So we have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and then I'd say a lot of it is just like getting outside and, and going out with things and submitting your data on eBERT. And hopefully you'll have a lot of fun while you're doing that. So, so far I talked about the joys of atlasing being um, to, that you get to learn where birds live, you get to contribute data for bird conservation, you get an intimate look into the lives of birds, be start a part of some really big projects. You can explore new places or discover new places. You have plenty to do to fill up your summer time um, and discover new friends. And hopefully, with all of that um, pulled together, um, you'll you'll see that Alicing is a really a great new way to go birding. So this is. Um, a list of our social media handles. So you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, the website URL is here, also our email. And then we do have a store, online store on Zazzle that, um, where you can go and buy hats and shirts and um, stickers and mugs and all that stuff if you're really into uh, swag. Uh, and we do accept donations. Uh, there's a donation button on the website that we accept donations through PayPal. So with that, I, I'm going to go back through and answer some of your questions that I've missed. And then please, um, please chime in and, and add more. Um, and if it's easier for you to, um, if you have a complicated question, you can unmute yourself and, and and speak your question as well. Um, Bird of the World is not an app. It is only a website. Um, right, and it's not the same as Peterson's. And Peterson's is like a field guide. The Birds of North America is like an encyclopedia. Um, it really has super detailed information on distribution and habitat and migration and breeding behaviors and predators and conservation issues and basically everything that you can imagine. Uh, 
Um, okay, this is uh, Pam had a good comment. Um, she said that she's been seeing a lot of common merganser, male and female pairs, and multiple males and single females. And she thought it was too early for them to be breeding in our area, the Northern Catskills, so she's just been observing, uh, entering them as observed. Um, so, yeah, so one of the changes that we made for this atlas is that there are a lot of people that really want to contribute to this project that don't have a lot of background information on which species are breeding where in the state and when. Um, and so, we decided because we're using AVERD, um, we can easily filter the data after the fact so that we can um, pull out like, actual nesting locations from the data. Um, but it's really important for us too to get a good handle on phenology. So that's the timing of the breeding. So we want to know when, when the birds are starting their courtship or starting to pair up when they're starting courtship, we want to know when they're starting to build their nest um, and all that stuff. So even though those common mergansers um, might not be breeding like nesting yet in your area, um, we still do want to know that, that you see them in pairs or, or as courting individuals. So that is a change from the previous atlas, but hopefully it makes the atlas a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Okay, let me see if I missed anything else. Okay. Um, yep, and um, somebody asked if they could, um, said that they couldn't do a lot of birding, but they do wanna help a little bit. Um, can they still be a part of things? Yes, definitely, I'd say, you know, as little um, or as much as you can do is great. You know, I think for a lot of birders, um, you know, some of the hardcore birders might be going to like the more pristine or remote areas to try to get interesting things. But for the Atlas purposes, we also wanna know like what's breeding in your backyard. Um, and, and sometimes getting access to the residential neighborhoods can be really hard. So even just reporting what you're seeing from your house um, or from your neighborhood can be can be really valuable to the atlas. Okay, and then someone's asking, is there a tool that will help us keep track of the total number of hours and the general progress toward block completion? And yes, so that is, I'm gonna go back to slides here. Okay. Okay, so for any block, um, you can go onto the eBird website and you go to the explore pages and you zoom in, when you zoom in and, and click on a block and look at the details for that block, you can see the total number of hours that has been spent there. Um, so for this block, the Oneonta Center East, you can see that there's been almost 11 hours during the daytime and 1.3 hours at night. And then just below that here, you can see there's been 14 checklists submitted by five atlasers. And then the next line gives you a summary, like a running tally of the number of species that have been reported uh, for that block. So you'll see there's an observed total. So those are species that were observed in the block, but for which there's no evidence of breeding. And then you have possible breeding, probable breeding, and confirmed breeding. And then you have a total. And the total is the sum of the possible, probable, and confirmed. So that's, of, that's the total of um, birds that are species that are attempting to breed in the block. Um, and then 
And then in terms of the specific species, if you want to track um, the highest code that has been observed for each species, you can do that um, down below here where you'll see that the highest code for house finch was a probable code for the courtship code, uh, courtship or copulation code. Um, the highest code that's been reported so far for crow is carrying nesting material. So, so this is really your one-stop shop to see the progress within a block. Um, and I know, I think that you also mentioned if you should summarize the data on your own. Um, and I do want to point out that, um, you know, that each block will have multiple observers um, and it will automatically be tallied for you at that level. Um, if, if you're interested um, for yourself, like what species you have have found in a block and you know what the highest code is that you've observed, you can track that also. Um, I have a couple of field data sheets on the website. So I have um, a field checklist and then also a block summary card. You can also track that there. Um, and one of the things, if you're like really committed to a particular block, um, you can, I, I would recommend that you, you jump onto eBird, onto this type of page before you go to the block um, and fill out one of the block summary cards and take that with you in the field so that then you can see, oh, nobody has, you know, submitted any wetland birds. So, I'm going to see if I can find a wetland in this block and I'm going to try to survey that habitat type um, to fill in those gaps, um, things like that. So, so that's a really handy way to, to get a summary of the progress of a block. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So then Adrian asked, is there a way to get identification from us, like a badge or something? So I don't have a badge. Um, I, I do have on my to-do list to make a business card that would have, um, you know, that would look a little bit more official. So it would say, you know, this is the Atlas project and this is the contact and website and all that stuff and have my contact information on there. Um, I, I don't, I have not gotten to that yet. Um, the one thing I will say, if you're really trying to look more official too, I've heard, you know, from talking to project coordinators for other state atlases, you know, they have had people um, wear um, bright, you know, fluorescent clothing. And, and then when people are, you know, standing on the side of the road with a bright, bright orange vest, People tend to to not be as concerned about them standing there because they they they're like oh that person's not trying to hide themselves they're not trying to do anything sneaky um, I can watch them I can see what they're doing and so that has kind of um, really helped as well to make it seem more official um, I will and then other people have been that suggested to wear like a, the Atlas hat that we have a, a cap baseball cap hat that you can wear, um, and that can also help too. Um, somebody asked if they're moving out of the New York area um, in the next five years, can they still participate? Yes, by all means, um, you know, for the time that you're here, please, please participate while you're here. Okay, am I missing a question? Anyone else have other questions?
Okay, well, tomorrow looks like a really sunny day. So hopefully you guys are um, excited and pumped after this to, to get out there and, and do some atlasing. Um, I do see a couple more questions though, so I can stay on for a bit and, and answer more questions, but if, if others of you want to sign off, then, then please feel free to do so. Um, I'm asking, okay, if they see a cardinal singing and report it, and then a few weeks later you see a male carrying nesting material, do you update the last observation? No, you just submit another checklist, and in that the next checklist, you you write down the behavior that you're observing, so carrying nesting materials. And then when you come to this block page, like I have up on the screen, um, it will show the highest code that has been reported for that species. So, so all of that data is in there. Um, and we're going to use your earlier observation of them singing to help us with that breeding phenology as well. So. Um, so, submitting all the information on separate checklists is the best way to go.